Good day everyone and welcome to my review of the RTX 2080. Is the 2080 an epic fail by Nvidia and is the old flagship, the GTX 1080 Ti the better GPU despite being older and cheaper? I planned on releasing this video much earlier but I did run into some issues with Steam, Uplay and Origin. That held me back a couple of days, I had some pretty bad luck there. But anyway, unlike most reviews out there, I will not be testing the Founders Edition card but this Gigabyte RTX 2080 Windforce OC 8G aftermarket model. Right now you could grab one for about 800 to 950 US dollars depending on where you live. So this appears to be some ridiculous pricing when considering how much a brand new GTX 1080 Ti Pascal GPU costs right now, at least in Europe. Understandably we as the consumers have all the right to expect more performance from this RTX 2080. But is this really the case here? Spoiler, no and this is why I'm a little upset. Okay, before I get misunderstood by some of you, I have nothing against this specific graphics card by Gigabyte. They just try to do their best with what they've got from Nvidia. The pricing policy and performance gains or losses are all on Nvidia. Just look at what those Founders Edition cards cost. Aside from that, to me it seems Gigabyte tried to make the best possible card they possibly could to make up for as much as possible. After all, the consumer is spending $800 or more more on a GPU like this. This brand new Turing GPU is based on a new 12 nanometer process and now features GDDR6 VRAM as opposed to GDDR5X we've seen on the 1080 Ti. However, we just get 8 gigabytes, which is rather disappointing to me, but more on that later. The specific card apparently can boost up to 1800 megahertz on the core. The TDP at 215 watts has come down slightly compared to Pascal and worth noting is the addition of our T and Tensor cores for those new features, real-time ray tracing, DLSS and stuff like that, which I'll talk about later. This card comes with Gigabyte's revamped Windforce 3X cooler featuring 380mm fans and a good amount of aluminum to deal with the heat. A metal backplate also comes into play not only supporting the PCB but possibly even doing its little part cooling the back of the card as well. One thing that bothered me with the Pascal generation of Windforce models was the thin and cheap plasticky feel of the shroud. While this one is out of plastic too, it has got much much thicker and pretty damn sturdy. Also I should mention there's one fan, the one in the middle, that spins in the opposite direction now to combat turbulent airflow. That's an interesting idea indeed. And while we're at it, that's a semi-passive cooler, meaning under light loads the fans won't even spin. Only once a certain temperature is reached, they'll spin up. But we see that on many many cards these days now, it's something we expect nowadays. Just like the 1080 Ti, the 2080 does require 8 pin plus 6 pin power connections and in terms of outputs, on board are 3 of the new DisplayPort 1.4a video outputs allowing for a resolution of 8k at 60hz. But what's that you ask? A USB type C port on a GPU? Yup, it's for virtual link for VR headsets. By the way, SLI now is a thing of the past. We've got NVLink taking over now, apparently it should scale better but that's something I won't be able to test out. Aesthetically speaking I will give Gigabyte props. They did an incredibly good job in my opinion, I like the more sleek and minimalistic approach, not quite as aggressive as on other models. Plus the length and overall dimensions are pretty normal for a high end GPU, so this should fit into most cases these days. Now while some despise RGB, some on the other hand love it, I personally think this subtle lighting is more than enough. We do get some effects to play around with in the Aorus engine software but let me tell you this software at the time of this video at least is still pretty buggy and applying colors and effects can be fairly tricky at times. Gigabyte still needs to fix some issues there. Now before I go and discuss the new features Nvidia brings to the table with their RTX launch, let's first run some tests. Please excuse the limited amount of graphics cards in the charts, as of today I'll actively review GPUs as well, therefore more will be coming soon. Also I hope you like my new testing methodology.
All right, where should I start? There are a couple of things wrong with this graphics card launch, in my opinion. In a synthetic test such as Time Spy, there is a noticeable and good performance improvement over the previous gen flagship, the GTX 1080 Ti. However, when actually looking at more practical scenarios such as gaming, the RTX 2080 more or less delivers the same frame rates as a 1080 Ti does, which is totally fine. That's extraordinarily good performance there, but the problem is the atrocious price you have to pay for it, at least in Europe. Especially with the 1080 Ti being out for much less money. But that's not even all. If you inspected those benchmarks closely, you sure have noticed the RTX 2080 drops behind the 1080 Ti in more than just one instance. Shockingly, the gaming experience on average is not as smooth with the 2080 as with a 1080 Ti. Just look at those 1% lows. Sure, that could change as drivers mature, but right now that's a bit of a letdown for me. Keep in mind the price. So of course I did check the temperatures of the card, those were perfectly fine. Gigabyte did manage to lower the noise level by quite a bit with their new Windforce design. This by far is the quietest Windforce GPU I've tested so far. Unfortunately though, most of the time GPU boost doesn't allow the card to go up and maintain those sweet 1800 MHz in-game. We are sitting at like 1665 MHz on average. In an upcoming video I'll show you how much overclocking actually affects the performance. And boy, there were some noteworthy improvements. Now to those new luxury features Nvidia brags about, namely real-time ray tracing, deep learning, super sampling, or for short, the LSS, and so on. Those look promising on paper, but there's no way we as the consumers can really try those features out. We are basically paying for something we don't even know will work properly or will be implemented correctly, if at all in future upcoming games. And this is what upsets me and many others. We've seen some underwhelming demos already, which makes this even more of a concern. But as things look right now, we have to look at traditional rendering, and that's where there's hardly any performance leaps going on. Quite the contrary, in many game titles we do see worse frame rates than with a 1080 Ti for instance. Yet we have to pay more for the 2080. And what's up with the 8 gigabytes of video memory? The 1080 Ti came with a whopping 11 gigabytes. Sure, the 2080 comes with brand new GDDR6, which in theory should do much better, but do we see those big improvements in day-to-day -day gaming use? No. Are 8 gigabytes enough right now? Most of the time, yes. But even now in 2018, there are games out there that easily eat up 8 gigabytes of VRAM, leaving not much if any headroom for the future. In my opinion, it was a very bold move of Nvidia equipping the 2080 with only 8 gigabytes. But then again, they want to sell that 2080 Ti that comes with 11, right? So the bottom line here is, the RTX 2080 is a very good powerful high-end graphics card. Technically, it's amazing. It's just the pricing and value that leaves a better aftertaste. But hats off to Gigabyte for apparently giving their best saving as much as there is to save. They can't change Nvidia's ridiculous pricing of course. So if you're in the market for a RTX 2080, I could definitely recommend getting this Windforce OC model. But due to the rather poor price to performance ratio from a consumer's point of view, I can only give the RTX 2080 my silver award. Sorry, I didn't mean this video to be this long, but I had to get some things off my chest. And with that said, thank you so much for watching.